We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are in the book of Exodus, and tonight it is time for us to look at Exodus chapter 5. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 5. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you've joined us. If you have any questions or concerns about tonight's class, if there's anything that we can do to help you in some way, if there's something that we need to be praying about, uh, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can reach out to us by making a call or sending a text to 608-224-0274. You could also send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can visit the website fourlakeschurch.org and use the contact information on that page. You can find that information on the screen in just a moment, and that should stay there throughout our study tonight. You can also find us on social media by going to the major platforms and searching for Four Lakes Church. We would also invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you can be reminded whenever we go live or add something to that channel. But tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So you may remember just by way of brief review at the end of Genesis, God uses Joseph to save his people and really the entire nation of Egypt from a terrible famine. But as we transition into Exodus, you may remember a new pharaoh comes on the scene, a man who does not know Joseph, a man who does not appreciate what Joseph had done many years earlier. And so he enslaves the Hebrew people. He makes their lives incredibly difficult. And really, he's scared that they may multiply even more than they already have and rebel against him and perhaps leave. And so he commands that the baby boys be killed as soon as they are born. And the midwives, of course, disobey that commandment from the king. The people continue to multiply. Moses is born during those years. He's rescued from the Nile River. He's raised in Pharaoh's household. But at the age of 40, he looks outdoors. He's looking around. He kills an Egyptian for mistreating a Hebrew slave. And so he spends the next 40 years in exile. Well, after 40 years in the land of Midian, God calls Moses to come back to Egypt. You may remember the burning bush. You may remember how Moses does everything in his power to try to get out of that. Five or six excuses that he gives there, God answers those one by one. But the, God wants him to go back to Egypt to demand that Pharaoh let the people go. And of course, Moses objects initially, ultimately, though, he obeys. And that brings us to Exodus chapter 5, where Moses, now 80 years old, he is back. He is back in Egypt, and he is about to confront Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, face to face. So let's jump right back into it tonight. And tonight we pick up with Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, the first paragraph. Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Well, we now have the first direct confrontation, don't we, between Moses and Pharaoh. And let's remember uh, Moses is a wanted man, isn't he? He was raised in Pharaoh's house. He killed the Egyptian. He went on the run. They were looking for him over the past 40 years. I think today we may think of Moses as being on the 10 most wanted list. I don't know if they still do that or not, but that's the idea. And now Moses and his brother, they are back, and they show up with a message from God to Pharaoh himself, let my people go. And they give the reason as the people needing to head out into the wilderness to celebrate some kind of religious feast. Well, as Moses anticipated, Pharaoh is completely unimpressed by that. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Some of the commentaries were making the point that the gods, according to Egypt, were known by the strength of the people that they were over. And so apparently Pharaoh could look at the Israelite people and think, well, these people are rather unimpressive. They are enslaved in my land. 
So why do I need to pay attention to their God? He's obviously not doing their, his job. For, but for whatever reason, he's not impressed by the Lord. And so right here at the beginning, from the very first request, Pharaoh has made a decision, hasn't he? Uh, he has decided that he will not obey the Lord's command. So Moses gives a command on the Lord's behalf. Moses refuses. A week or so ago, you may remember, we discussed the question of whether God hardened Pharaoh's heart or whether Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And I think right here at the beginning, Pharaoh makes a decision. He chooses to disobey the Lord's command, and that'll only get worse from here. Well, at this point, Moses and Aaron try again. They don't just walk away after the first attempt, but they come again. And this time, they rephrase things just a little bit. They emphasize that God has met with them, so we've seen God. And then they ask nicely, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness so that we can sacrifice. And then they give another reason. Otherwise, our God will fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. So what they seem to be doing here is to explain that this will not be good for Pharaoh. Really, either way this goes. If, if you don't let us go, our God will kill us anyway. And then you still won't have our free labor. So if you're keeping us here for the labor, uh, that's not going to work. Because our God is going to be so mad at us, he's going to kill us right here. And so either way, Pharaoh will no longer benefit from the Israelites. So they're taking that out of the equation. Or to put it another way, there is no good thing that can come from Pharaoh not allowing the people to lead. Well, Pharaoh's response, though, comes in the form of a command to get back to work. He sees Moses and Aaron as troublemakers who are just trying to keep the people from working. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. That'll be our next paragraph tonight. Exodus chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Again, Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors? So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw. To make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they were making previously you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it because they are lazy. Therefore they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men and let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to false words. And what I find interesting here is that Moses apparently isn't giving up, is he? In my mind, Pharaoh says no twice in a row in that first paragraph, and Moses is apparently still standing there, isn't he? He doesn't just walk away, doesn't just slink off to the side, but he's still there. So that's pretty bold. Here's Moses as a fugitive. He's been refused twice before the most powerful man in the world at this point, demanding freedom for two to three million slaves. And he keeps at it. So Pharaoh speaks again. This time, Pharaoh arranges a consequence. Instead of punishing Moses personally, Instead of having Moses executed on the spot, which he certainly could have done, Pharaoh instead emphasizes yet again that the people are many and that Moses is trying to take away that source of free labor. And then he orders the taskmasters to have the people gather their own straw for the bricks that they were making. If you guys ever have a chance to head down to Chicago, I would highly recommend spending at least half a day at what is now known as the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures Museum at the University of Chicago. It used to be called the uh, Oriental Institute, and it was up until about a year or two ago. They just now changed the name very recently. Of course, the, the term Oriental is uh, coming to disfavor. It was not originally offensive, but it has come to be that through the year. So they've changed it now. So it's the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures Museum. And I've been there a number of times. Wayne Jackson uh, has an article on Christian Courier uh, where he says, if you're anywhere within a couple hours of Chicago, you have to go to this place. And he writes an article about some of the uh, artifacts that they have there and kind of summarizes those. And the first time I went was with a, a church group from the church in Crystal Lake. One of the members at that time was a school bus driver. And so we, I think, rented a school bus, and she was our driver, got us down there, and I was amazed back then when I was eight or nine years old, and I've been back several times since then. But the last time I went down there, I took the Badger bus down to, I think, maybe Union Station or in that area there in Chicago, and then took a, a Chicago City bus uh, for transportation a little bit further to the museum and then walked a few blocks from there. But you can do it completely on public transportation. That's all I'm saying. 
and they just have some amazing artifacts that they basically looted from Egypt and some of the other ancient cultures back in the early 1900s. They just went over there and and took stuff. So, I mean, that's obviously not ideal. Some of that stuff they are returning, I believe, very slowly. Uh, but in their collection, they actually have a uh, kind of a small-scale model of a brick press from ancient Egypt, and I think they found it in the tomb of one of the pharaohs who was uh, ruling at roughly the time this would have taken place. And so they were known for putting miniatures in the tombs in case that pharaoh needed to make bricks in the afterlife. Uh, he would have uh, all of the tools that he needed, or at least models, so he could recreate those tools on the other side. I think that was kind of the thought behind that. Uh, but it's basically a wooden form, and it's got a couple handles on it, if I remember that correctly. And they explained that they would fill that form with mud and with straw, and that they would then press it down into that brick. And then they would lay it out in the sun to dry. And then they would repeat that process hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of times. And that's how they would build their structures back in ancient Egypt. I know a lot of times we think about pyramids. And of course, that was cut out of stone, uh, stone quarries and so on. But that's not the kind of construction we're talking about. We're talking about common everyday buildings, homes, uh, government buildings, and so on. Often they were built out of these baked bricks. And we have found a sample and they have a sample baked brick at the University of Chicago down there and it's neat to look at it you can actually see remnants of straw mixed in uh, with the uh, with the mud that was made in that press well obviously a key ingredient to those bricks was straw and apparently up to this point the Egyptians had others gathering these huge quantities of straw for the brick making process uh, but now the Israelites have to gather their own straw so now they have this additional responsibility thrown on them. So now instead of just making bricks, they've now got to go get the straw themselves. But they have the same quota. So they've still got to make the same number of bricks, but they're about to have to work a whole lot harder than they were before. And it was already difficult. And I think we see what Pharaoh is doing here, don't we? Instead of making a Moses a martyr of some kind to the, you know, so that people could rally around him and escape or strike or, or do whatever on their own, he's trying to turn the people against Moses. And I think most of us recognize this is a method that uh, leaders have been using, I think, ever since, probably even before this. But punishing the entire group for the actions of one troublemaker in an attempt to turn the group against the troublemaker, it's not really fair, is it? But sometimes it works, and perhaps Pharaoh knew that this may work, and so this is the, uh, the path that he takes. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. The next paragraph, Exodus 5, verses 10 through 14. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters pressed them, saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not completed your required amount, either yesterday or today, in making brick as previously? So this is now the practical result of Moses confronting Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The taskmasters and the foremen crack down. They enforce Pharaoh's command. And they explain it to the people. So there's this chain of command. Word gets down. And then they turn up the pressure. And in response, the Israelites have to scatter all throughout the land of Egypt to gather straw. And I don't know whether I had noticed this previously, but instead of being concentrated all in one place... Notice that now the people have to spread out to go find straw. So they, they weren't able to gather straw just from the immediate area, but they had to go all over the entire land of Egypt. And if you think about it that way, that scattering would have made it a lot harder for Moses to lead them out, wouldn't it? And I hadn't really thought about that before, but uh, Pharaoh's being, I think, very strategic here in spreading the people out all over the land of Egypt instead of being concentrated in one place. Uh, the other detail we have here is that the foremen are beaten. So the taskmasters are the Egyptians, but the foremen are the Israelites who have been put in charge of the people. 
And so there is a chain of command, and the foremen are the ones who are beaten. So not all the slaves are beaten. That wouldn't be very productive. So they just beat the leaders of the slaves, kind of making an example of them and trying to uh, encourage them, we might say, to get the job done faster than they were. So the command is that the people have to gather their own straw while producing the same number of bricks. And we notice here that the people are falling behind, aren't they? And not just a few hours behind. This is a day or two behind. They are really falling behind. They cannot do it. So they're not getting the job done. They're unable to do this. Uh, maybe you've heard the saying or seen the meme explaining the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> um, and in a sense, that seems to be what's going on here. The people are falling behind, and so the Egyptians beat the foreman. And that's not really going to help it if we think about it. Uh, but the goal, of course, is not to improve morale. Uh, but it seems to me the goal here is to turn those managers against Moses. That's really what's going on here. Um, and so Pharaoh is trying to divide these people. If you remember, it was a taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave that got Moses so mad in the first place, wasn't it? Roughly 40 years before this. And that's what caused him to go on the run. So I think this is almost Pharaoh's way of saying to Moses, I dare you to try to do something about it this time. I dare you to step in here. You know, you thought it was bad 40 years ago when you saw that taskmaster beating an Egyptian. Now they're all uh, beating the Hebrews, rather. So, you know, give me one more reason to have you executed. So Pharaoh seems almost to be demonstrating his power over Moses. And in a sense, you know what he's also doing? He's demonstrating his power over the God of Moses by rebelling against God's command. He is in the process of hardening his own heart. He's already made that decision. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 5 verses 15 through 21. Exodus chapter 5 verses 15 through 21. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are being beaten, but it is the fault of your own people. But he said, You are lazy, very lazy. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work, for you will be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble. Because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Pharaoh's plan seems to be working, doesn't it? The Israelite foreman bypass the taskmasters, and they take their concerns straight to Pharaoh, don't they? That's a risky move right there, isn't it? Ignoring the chain of command. And I don't know if you've ever had to do this, but talking to your boss's boss, it's a risky move. So they take that move, they make that move, but notice Pharaoh uh, turns it around. And so it's kind of interesting how this whole passage goes down. Um, by the way, instead of crying out to Pharaoh, who should they have been crying out to? Well, they should have been crying out to God, but they don't. They cry to Pharaoh instead. They complain about the straw. They complain about the quota of bricks. They complain about being beaten. They blame it on the taskmasters. I think we're going to see this um, element of complaining come up a little bit here and there over the next 40 years or so. But again, Pharaoh turns it around. And Pharaoh accuses them of being lazy. And Pharaoh ties this to Moses' request to head out into the wilderness to sacrifice. But I also want us to notice, Pharaoh doesn't call out Moses by name at this point. But instead, he simply ties this to Moses' request. Well, you people wanted to go out and sacrifice, so this is why we're doing what we're doing. So, you know, Pharaoh is playing stupid here. He's letting the foreman come to their own conclusion and he repeats the order concerning the straw. He repeats the demand to maintain the previous quota of bricks. And, uh, and then they realize they're really in trouble. I mean, it was bad. 
Uh, but now they've heard it directly from the king himself, and now they are really facing a, a tough issue. So they've gone all the way to the top, and there is no relief whatsoever. Now they're probably going to get in trouble for talking to their boss's 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 boss. And uh, the beatings will almost certainly get even worse. There is no way to keep making the same number of bricks while also be res being responsible for gathering the straw from all over the nation. Well, it just so happens that as they leave, they just randomly run into Moses and Aaron waiting for them. And it's not really random, is it? It seems like Moses and Aaron are kind of out there wondering what's going on. They're waiting. And, and notice their attitude toward Moses and Aaron. It's all your fault. They make the connection. Moses and Aaron have caused this. So not only do they not call out to God for help, but now they call on God to condemn Moses for what he's done. For you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of all his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Uh, by the way, we saw this word odious in our study of Genesis. And as soon as I read the word odious preparing for tonight's class, I'm like, we have seen that before. And I was kind of thinking what it is. I, I did a search and found it back in Genesis 34, verse 30. Do you remember when Simeon and Levi avenged the rape of their sister Dinah by tricking and then murdering the men of Shechem? Remember how Jacob got mad? Not at the men of Shechem for raping his daughter, but he got mad at Simeon and Levi for making him odious among the inhabitants of the land. And we discussed that in great depth uh, a few months ago. But in the same way, the foremen see Moses and Aaron as making the Israelites odious, stinky, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants. In other words, Everything was just fine here in Egypt until you came along. Isn't that what they're saying? And yet, is that really true? No. As we learned all the way back at the beginning of Exodus, Pharaoh was already terrified that the Israelites would stage an uprising and leave. And he was treating them harshly, even way back in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. Um, Moses is just the trigger here. He's just the focal point for these people. Uh, kind of a thought question. What do you think is going through Moses' mind at this point? What do you think Moses is thinking about right at this moment? He's minding his own business as a shepherd out there in the land of Midian in the middle of nowhere at the age of 80. He's got a flock of sheep. He's sitting there with the staff making sure they're fed. He's, it's not too bad. It's a good life. God shows up in the burning bush, harasses him into going back to Egypt to rescue his people. And now the people that he sent to rescue are blaming Moses for being beaten. That has to be so frustrating. I mean, in my own mind, I'm thinking, I didn't ask for this. I was fine where I was. I came back to save you people, and now you don't appreciate it, and so on. Well, instead of complaining to Moses and Aaron, what might have been a better move for the foreman at this point? Well, obviously, as I mentioned a few moments ago, they should have cried out to God. They should have said something to encourage Moses and Aaron. They should have given Moses their support. Well, thank you for trying to work this out, uh, but we're with you. We're behind you 100%. Let's get out of here. But that is not exactly what they do, is it? It's the opposite. They do the opposite of what they should have done. So let's conclude tonight with the last couple verses. This is Exodus chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Exodus 5, 22 and 23. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Unfortunately, this situation really gets to Moses. He's feeling it. He's frustrated. And now we have Moses coming back, complaining to God. He's barely gotten started. But Moses has had it. He's discouraged. He's disillusioned. I mean, imagine having men covered in blood, cuts and bruises, broken teeth, broken bones perhaps coming up to you and saying, you did this to me. You caused this to happen. We were fine before you got here. And now we're odious in the sight of Pharaoh and he's beating us and, and it was fine until you showed up. Well, Moses is obviously, he's, he's taking this very personally. And so he turns around and he pours this out to the Lord. Basically, God, you told me to do this. And now these terrible things are happening. And really, he 
basically, doesn't he accuse God of lying? You told me that you would use me to deliver the people, and yet you have not delivered your people at all? It's a pretty straightforward accusation of God. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 5. I mean, in terms of a practical application, we don't have to have a practical application of everything we study. Uh, but I would just encourage us to think about the fact that sometimes when we do what God wants us to do, our circumstances may actually get worse instead of better, at least in the short term. And we've seen this tonight with Moses. As I pointed out just a few moments ago, Moses was completely content tending sheep out there in the wilderness, and yet God called him to go back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh, which he does. He obeys. And then he suffers for it. And I think we'll admit, it, it was a tough assignment. And, and when he obeyed, I mean, God's own people were abused even worse than they were before. And then Moses gets ridiculed, and he gets harassed over this by the people he came to save. And of course, we're not even done yet. We haven't even started this practically. And uh, this is certainly not the end of this story. This is just a snapshot in time. Uh, but at least right at this moment, Moses obeys. And he suffers for it. He does what's right. And then he's in this mental anguish, uh, questioning himself, questioning God over what he's doing. Well, you know what? As we think back, the same thing happened to Joseph, didn't it? Joseph interprets dreams. That was a power given to him by God. And he suffers because of it. His brothers beat him up, throw him into the pit, sell him into slavery. And then even down in Egypt, remember Joseph refusing the advances of Potiphar's wife? He does the right thing. And how's he rewarded? He's falsely accused. He's thrown into prison for it and neglected for some time. I mean, similar things happen in the Old Testament to uh, Daniel and to Jeremiah, many of the great prophets, including even John the Baptist that we read about in the New Testament. You remember John the Baptist, he preached God's truth on marriage. It would have been so easy to ignore that and just preach something else to King Herod. But he has to get into the whole situation with, his, you know, you're married, your brother's wife, but you're not really married. And you know what? He preaches God's truth. He pays for that with his life. It's not fair, is it? It's not fair at all. Life is not fair. I mean, sometimes evil people do some terrible things. And that shouldn't surprise us at all. As John the Apostle says over in 1 John 3.13, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. <laughs> Shocker. Terrible people do terrible things. That's what the world does. Or maybe we think about what Jesus said over in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.10-12. through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Moses is identified as a prophet. Moses is in that category. So I would just take all of this as a reminder. We are not to judge our faithfulness to God by how the world reacts to us. I think that's a good takeaway from this uh, chapter here. The world has never been good at making accurate judgments concerning what God wants us to do. Is that a true statement? I think that's a very true statement based on the whole of biblical teaching. Um, the world doesn't get us. The world doesn't understand. You know, for example, I could restudy what God has said on some issue of the day, whatever the issue of the day might be, and I could change my mind, and I, and I could uh, agree with the world and disagree with what God says in his word. And you know what? The world may very well applaud. Ooh, this guy is so courageous and brave. This preacher here in Madison has, has restudied the issue. St uh, you know, stunning and brave, isn't that the, uh, the saying? Uh, amazing courage to, to restudy this thing. Uh, several years ago, I remember seeing a headline from a satire site. I'm pretty sure it was the one that we're all familiar with uh, on religious things. I kind of leave the name out of it, maybe. But if I remember the headline, it, it said something like, Area Minister Praised as Courageous for Changing His Beliefs to Be Exactly What Everybody Else in the World Currently Believes. That was the gist of it. That was the basic headline. You know, uh, amazing courage. You now believe what everybody else believes. Woohoo, that's an amazing thing. Your, your courage you've got there. Uh, but I think it's a reminder that what we believe is not to be determined by how the world reacts. 
Because when we obey, when we believe and teach and obey the truth, the world may very well react just like Pharaoh reacts here. And God's own people may even be upset with us, as happened here in Exodus chapter 5. We do what God wants us to do. We teach what he wants us to teach. And we get it from both sides. The world's mad and God's people are mad. And we end up being stuck in there uh, in the middle with God. Uh, the lesson is, do the right thing, even when it's difficult. And we learn this from Moses in Exodus chapter 5. Uh, with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 930. I think we're getting ready to wrap up the book of 2 John. It's like the shortest book, I think Stuart said on Sunday, the shortest book in the New Testament. And uh, so we're in the second half of the shortest book in the New Testament, and uh, that'll be at 9.30, and then we come together at 10.30. We're getting back to Hebrews, looking at the Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, comments on tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, something we need to be praying about, uh, get in touch. That contact information should still be there on your screen. And if you're joining us on the phone, obviously you can't see that, so uh, feel free to text me or give me a call personally at 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you. Uh, as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thank you for giving us your word delivered to us through the writing of your servant, the prophet Moses. We're thankful for Moses' courage in doing what you told him to do, even though it was difficult, even though he suffered for it. He could have very easily given up. He could have gone straight back to Midian. Tonight we pray for courage to always do what's right. We pray for courage to always listen to your message and to preach it faithfully, regardless of how the people around us may react. Our Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.